Welcome everyone to the Richmond Planning Commission meeting of October 2nd, 2024. To our guests, speakers, and our members at this point, it looks like we don't have any other guests so far. Anyway, welcome everyone. Um, we're going to review the agenda really quickly just to make sure that they that is what we want to do. After our housekeeping, um, we're going to have the NDA presentation by Taylor and Maya from CCRPC for the first hour. And then um, we're going to talk about the Jolina Court uh, draft that we have in front of us, all of it except for the density bonus work that we're doing kind of separately that will be slid in. Any adjustments to the agenda? Anyone want to talk about anything else at this point? Okay, not hearing anything or seeing any hands, we'll proceed with the agenda as posted. Um, we have no public here at the moment, so no public comment on anything not on the agenda. We'll quickly take a minute to review the minutes of our September 18th, 24 meeting. Any alterations or uh, changes, corrections, anything anyone would like to say about those meetings from the 918 meeting? Oh, it looks like we have one guest, Bard, welcome. Hi. All right, I am not hearing any corrections or additions to the minutes of our 918 meeting, so we will accept those minutes into the record as written. Okay, and Bard, I'm assuming you do not want to make a public comment on a non-agenda item, is that correct? Bard. Hi, Bard. Bard is frozen. All right, well, we'll let him make a comment later if he wishes to. He's probably here for the agenda. So our first agenda item is um, CCRPC has graciously agreed to come and talk to us about the neighborhood development area program. Um, so uh, I am going to let you people have the floor and talk to us about why we want to have the neighborhood development program, what it will do for us, what we need to do for it. So take it away, you guys. All right. Um, I will start. I'm going to share my screen. Um, if that's something I can do. Um, I always... Okay. Is it is it full or can you see the like slides on the left? I can see it's full now. Okay. Okay. It's great. Um, I ask every time because I just you know, who knows. Yep. Um, I already introduced myself. I'm Maya. Um, yeah, and this is just to kind of talk through the NDA neighborhood development area designation program. Um, what it is what it can do and then kind of our role um, moving forward and if you guys want to go through with it. So um, it's a state designation with the Vermont Agency of Commerce and Community Development. It's intended to um, provide permit and tax incentives for communities and developers that um, have committed to kind of these denser complete streets policies and their bylaws around their cores and centers and downtowns. There's currently three designations for the core, village center, downtowns, and new town centers. Richmond has a village center. And then there's two add-on designations to the core. So neighborhood, neighborhood development area, um, what we're talking about today, and then growth centers. Several other municipalities um, in Chittenden County have NDAs, including Burlington, Essex Junction, Hinesburg, South Burlington, and Winooski. Um, I'm gonna let Taylor go over the benefits. 
Sure. So uh, the NDA program is is essentially set up to provide benefits that incentivize housing development primarily around the course. So in the case of Richmond, around your village center. And so we'll do a quick overview of, of different benefits that are, are available. Uh, the first benefit is just uh, permit fees for state wastewater permits are capped at $50, which can be uh, a pretty substantial savings, uh, especially when you're talking about multifamily housing. Um, there is a tax exemption on the land gains tax, depending on how long someone's owned the property prior. Um, I don't know a lot of detail about that particular benefit, but I'm happy to get more details if that's uh, of interest. Uh, Character-based appeals of local DRB decisions um, or appeals of conditional use decisions are, are uh, limited in that the character of the area criteria in conditional use cannot be the basis of an appeal. And so that can be really beneficial for multifamily uh, housing that's developed in NDAs. A lot of times neighbors do appeal based on that character of the area criteria. Um, there in the, in the past, there used to be uh, some tax credits that were available related to, to NDAs, but uh, right now that's, that's not funded. Um, TIF is available, uh, tax increment financing uh, for NDA areas. That's a pretty heavy lift, probably for a place like Richmond, but um, it is possible. Uh, perhaps the most important benefit, and the reason why we're talking to you to uh, talking to you today, really, is that the regional planning commissions are about. We're just tasked in Act One Eighty One, the big Act Two Fifty bill last year, that was passed last year, to develop a new regional future land use map, and. Part of what we're going to be responsible for as regional planning commissions is uh, defining the area of the state designation programs in our regional plans in the future. So right now with your village center, Richmond goes to the state and gets the boundaries of that village center approved. And every five years that village center expires, you have to essentially reapply. In the future, that whole system goes away the RPCs are going to be responsible for mapping those village centers and these NDAs. And so why that's important is that if Richmond gets an NDA in place uh, before we develop our new regional future land use map, which probably will be adopted in early 2026, it essentially means that that neighborhood development area is grandfathered. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, in and, and kind of automatically included in that new regional future land use map um, without any additional process. And so, you know, by getting state approval now, um, I think you're making our lives easier at the RPC, potentially your own lives easier uh, in Richmond when we go to develop this regional future land use map with you. Um, and yeah, really kind of sets the process up to be a little smoother um, as we develop this new map over the next year. I just dropped a lot on you. Are there any questions on benefits? There's more benefits too. Oh, I got more benefits. I forgot I had a second slide. There's three slides. <laughs> uh, excuse me, Taylor. Yes. Hi, Mark Fossil. Um, mm -hmm. So you're encouraging towns to get involved in the NDA program before it comes out of state control and is moved into uh, regional planning Correct. offices. Correct. What, what is, yeah, could you go over not just NDA benefits, but, but what is the benefit of doing it now over procrastinating? Um, I think, uh, Mark, some of this is a little theoretical. So what I'll say is that um, getting in now guarantees you that a certain geography will be considered an NDA in the future, essentially. And why is that a good thing? That's a good thing because we've never done regional future land use mapping before, right? And now, oh. now the region, well, sorry, let me, take the, let, me, let me take a step back. We've done it in the past. Now we're required to do it in a whole new way. And we're okay. required to do it in the same way as all the other RPCs in the state. Essentially what statute says now is there's, there's these 10 typologies 
that we have to use to develop this new regional future land use map, these 10 different district types. And so, Mark, I think in uh, we're going to have to work with each municipality to figure out what parts of land in each municipality fit within these 10 district types. And I think that's very clear for like the core district. That's going to be Richmond's Village Center, maybe a couple parcel, parcels around it. But when we get into that next layer, which, you know, uh, this is a little confusing. And one day I'm going to have a graphic we're working on with our communications person right now. It's going to be a little smoother on how to explain this. But um, there's essentially three things we're mapping as a region. We're mapping one, these 10 typologies. We're mapping two, the state designation areas, which are going to be no longer five designations, but two, core and neighborhood. Neighbor and NDA essentially transitions into neighbor. The third thing we're doing is we're uh, going to be mapping different tiers of Act 250 jurisdiction. That's a whole other thing that I can get into at the end. That's more complicated. On the regional future land use map part of it, you know, the village center essentially becomes the core designation. And then there's two other districts that we have to map. One is plan growth area. The other is village area. And they're defined in statute in a way that doesn't directly align with the NDA requirements that exist now. And so what I'm trying to say there is that by getting designation now, that geography is essentially grandfathered in because of that second rung of things we need to map. If you don't get NDA designation now, it's probably more of just a conversation <laughs> that we don't know how it's gonna play out. Essentially getting NDA now provides you with more certainty that a large, that a, that a specific area around your core is going to reap these benefits in the future. It's and certainty. Those benefits are, I guess we'll get into that a little bit. I, I think I have an idea because I know we've, we've gone down this road a few times in my uh, tenure on the commission. Got uh, it. <clears throat> so I'm curious to see uh, what's evolved and, and, and what's pushing the issue now. But Pardon? I'll 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 bide my time and 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 wait for your presentation. Thank you. I'm sure there'll be future opportunities for more questions this evening. <laughs> I, I'm my question, Taylor, is kind of in the weeds on TIF, which we kicked around a little bit in Richmond. Mm -hmm. So if there were an NDA district that mm -hmm. were not the historic village core, it would be eligible for TIF, but it would still have to go through the process of being approved, if I recall, by the voters to be a TIF district as Correct. well. So it's sort of a yellow light, not a green light, right? If Correct. And sorry, this is complicated because we're at a time where we just passed this giant landmark bill and things are changing. But my understanding, Bart, is that under this new designation system, where we have now have only two designations, core and neighborhood, only those geographic areas in Vermont will be eligible for TIFs at all. You know, in, in past days, you didn't need to be in some sort of state designated area to be eligible for a TIF. There's whole swaths of Milton that are industrial park that are, that are in a TIF right now. You're not gonna be able to do that in the future. This whole slide here essentially is just telling you in, in very specific ways that uh, areas and NDAs are, have a priority for a whole slew of state grant funds. It's about getting money to property owners to develop and redevelop their properties. And so, um, or in the case of the first option, municipal planning grants, it's about providing municipalities with money. Mark, do you have a second question? Yeah, just wondering those uh those grant benefits and those types of things are only for property owners within the NDA, not for the town as a whole or neighboring. Yeah, in the um so good question. For the grants that are listed here that are municipal specific, the benefit is for the full uh municipality. If this grant program is uh aimed at property owners, the benefit's just for property owners in the NDA not the entire municipality. And so the first two municipal planning grants and then bike ped transportation alternatives grants, those are municipal grants. So the municipality is gaining benefit. 
the third grant, which is uh, priority assessment funds for potential brownfields, that's for an individual property owner who has property in, in the NDA. Community development block grants. Uh, that's interesting and in that the, the municipality has to be the grantee, but the money itself can flow through the municipality and benefit a specific property owner. So I've worked on a couple of community development block grants in the past where um, the city of St. Albans received the funds and subgranted them to a child care owner. Right. And that child care owner bought property and that child care owner expanded to add additional um, capacity at their facility. Um, affordable housing funds, those would be for specific property owners developing affordable housing. Uh, VOREC, um, that could go either way. It could be municipal or it could be a specific property owner. Same thing with the electric vehicle supply equipment. Drinking and clean water funding, uh, that would be a municipal specific benefit. That's a municipal specific fund. And the Better Places crowdfunding grant. So this is where uh, ACCD has a program where uh, you can do demonstration projects to create a new town square or center or uh, to redesign an intersection. And if selected, folks can crowd or the municipality can crowdfund a bunch of money and ACCD will match it and pay for your demonstration project or whatever else you're trying to do. And so that's a municipal focused grant part. You know, um, and I don't see it on this list. It may be my own shortcomings, um, but, and this came up actually at a meeting earlier this week at CCRPC and not to be too parochial, but one of the issues that has come up over the years and never really is never gets alive and never dies either is extension of mm -hmm. particularly wastewater. So that's one of the potential interests perhaps of the town of an NDA is, and are there any present or future conversations that you're aware of about um, grants or matching funds or incentives for that infrastructure beyond clean water, but to the sort of the other side, if you will, of wastewater? The clean water funding here is wastewater. Okay. Um, and so a couple of things there, Bard. Yeah, I mean, that fund it's, that we're talking about here um, is mostly low interest grants. Or sorry, low interest loans. There are some grants for those municipalities that have uh, financial challenges um, or are serving folks that um, are primarily low and moderate income. You know, I think for like, we're in Richmond, so let's talk about the village versus kind of the, the Western Gateway. Richmond likely won't be able to meet the NDA requirements in the gateway now per like the, the zoning that exists to be frank. And so less of a, not gonna quite scratch your back on that part. I think, you know, it's, this is very much focused on the, the the village itself and around that village center designation. Cool, all right, that's very helpful. Thank you, Taylor. Any other questions on benefits? We'll go to the next slide and I think I'm handing it back to Maya. Brothers AC Act 250 benefits. Oh man, there's a bunch of Act 250 benefits too. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, um, longer term, the potential benefit is that this NDA area beyond your village center area could be exempt from Act 250. That there's a lot of uh, municipal decisions that need to happen between uh, where you are now and how that could happen. But in this future scheme of regional and future land use mapping, uh, if you have an NDA, you have a core and you have a neighborhood designation around it, some uh, some of, if not all, that area could be uh, exempt from Act 250. In the case that it's not, um, there are a bunch of benefits potentially in terms of uh, if you remain under Act 250 jurisdiction. Uh, one of the benefits is there are interim exemptions that exists between now and whenever the region adopts our new regional future land use map for housing development. And so I believe in NDA areas, essentially any housing development that's, uh, it's either 50 or 75 units, I believe it's 50 in NDA areas. Any any development that's developing 50 or fewer uh, units of housing is exempt from Act 250. So that's big. Um, if you remain under Act 250 jurisdiction longer term, there is a, an exemption for specifically mixed income priority housing projects. That is not well defined in the statute. I have trouble understanding exactly what that means. 
Um, but typically that means uh, a housing development that is partially affordable, perpetually, probably 15 or 20 percent. But I, I could confirm that for you if you're interested. Uh, in the cases you're just developing a whole bunch of housing, none of it's affordable. You don't qualify for an interim exemption or a priority housing project. You get a fee reduction of 50 percent. Um, you also get a reduction in uh, in fee in terms of uh, the mitigation fee required for uh, impacting primary agricultural soils, which is a lot of Richmond, uh, especially uh, south of the village center. Um, and then you get a whole bunch of presumptions in terms of you a project meeting uh, Act 250 criteria, specifically 9L, um, if the the physical development is located in an NDA. Any questions here on Act 250? So again, these benefits are for the district itself, not- Yeah, the, these benefits the here would be for property owners in the district itself, correct. Okay. So a lot of those wouldn't really apply. Just the property owners, yeah. Okay, Hannah, get back over to Maya. Um, so this is for projects that are that have occurred inside NDAs in the state. Um, from like I guess before all this legislation has changed things up. I don't know how this will change moving forward, but they've reported that the program has supported the development of over three thousand eight hundred dwelling units and in mixed income developments saved an average of $50,000 in fees per project and reduced project permit timelines by around seven months. Um, and these, and so that, that dollar amount and that timeline reduction, um, that information comes from surveys directly with developers who developed within NDAs of the past decade. Thank you. Um, requirements. So there are several requirements. There's a proposed map component um, with the boundary of a quarter mile from village center that kind of can be reworked based on kind of what the town wants to see um, and what areas kind of fit the bylaw requirements. There also is a suggestion to avoid a requirement to avoid natural resources. Um, so kind of the flood plain um, wetland areas kind of be removed from that. Um, the bylaw requirements uh, look for complete street standards within the NDA area. Density requirements that are kind of met now by the Act 181. Um, and then kind of uses lots and buildings for um, orientation to the street, parking lot being on the you know side or back of the building, maximum setbacks, kind of things to create um, kind of more of the walkable neighborhood, sidewalks, minimum uh, lane widths, things like that. Um, Taylor, My, I'm gonna, can I go back to the density just to yeah. provide a little clarity? Yeah. And so you know, Maya mentioned that uh, Richmond already meets the density standard, um, and that is because of the Home Act last year before Act 181. And that's that essentially Sorry. says that you're, if you're in an area served by water, municipal water and municipal sewer, you have to allow for at least five units per acre. Okay. And that's, that's the line for NDA. So you already meet that requirement. Thank you. Sorry for the wrong reference. I'm learning a lot here in this, these two months. Um, Doing fine. <laughs> Taylor already mentioned this, but uh, post Kind of the new framework from the state is going to be from the five designations to two, just centers and neighborhoods, and then the three steps within centers. Um, applications under the current framework deadline is next um, October. So CCRPC's role, um, what we can do uh, is a bylaw audit. So kind of go through the application requirements and assess how their new bylaws fit into that or spaces that they need updating or changing to meet the standards. Um, we can do a map, we can create maps for that, uh, propose kind of areas and then 
work that out with you. And then there's also mapping requirements to kind of show different features. Um, we can do that. And then if you need changes to meet the application requirements, we can propose bylaw language and then ultimately preparing and submitting um, an application once uh, all that other stuff has, has happened. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, this all started uh, with a email from Charlie and, and uh, Taylor on this, and there's funding that has been made available for this specific part of it. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that the board was aware of that. I believe that there was funding made available for five municipalities. And one of the requirements is for us, for those municipalities to have a, at least a village designation. Yes. And, um, that's, I just wanted to bring that uh, point into clarity, that's all. Yes, we have grant money to do this this work. Yeah, no cost to the town. Uh, you know, this is a, uh, the state had $100,000 to support this work across the state. Uh, so ACCD had that money. It was first come, first serve. Um, we asked Keith if he was interested. Um, and we have, you know, so we have four municipalities interested here in Chittenden County. So we're working with, we would like to work with Richmond, uh, the town of Essex, uh, Shelburne and my I'm missing the last one Milton Milton as well um so I think you know we can help do the audit as a first step figure out if there are any places that your bylaw may need to improve to be eligible for an NDA bring that information back to you folks and have a discussion about whether or not you want to pursue an application or not um, and so that's what we're really looking for direction on tonight is, do you want us to do that bylaw audit? And would you like to see the results of that audit in a few months? Just to kind of look at the map area. So it's a quarter mile from the village center. This is from um, the Vermont planning atlas. And then on here also are um, the flood insurance map in kind of the hashed pink, 1% annual chance floodplain in pink, class two wetlands in dark green, and then wetland advisory in light green. Um, we would kind of help edit this map if you wanted to move forward um, with the audit. And then, yeah, just feedback and questions. Back, back to, to that map, the uh, the area that's in in orange or yellow, whichever you know, your color is, that that is the current village designation right now. Yes. Uh, and and the bulbous area around there is a general area of a quarter mile from there. My understanding is that could be manipulated based on geography and and the like. It doesn't have to. It's not written in stone that it's you know a quarter of an acre. Or anything like that. Yes. A quarter, quarter of a mile. So it can go beyond that if the if you meet certain requirements. So, so you're saying, uh, Keith, you just mentioned the designated village area. Yes, we don't we don't have a formal designated village area, do we? Yes, we yeah, do. you have a designated village center. Yeah, the that's the center. we do now. Yeah, we have yeah. a village center. Okay. Yep, it's on the map. And, nope. Uh, yep, it's it's that it's that area that's in the yellow. Okay. All right. Um. So will that be able to cross over into um, south of the river? I was just about to say that, Mark. We don't know. Um, but I think that's that's the big question because, you know, we have this big old natural resource, this big old floodplain in the middle. Yeah. But you've got businesses on the south side um, and a bunch of land area, frankly, that's that's got access to water and sewer, right, um, that might be – a good fit. And so that's one of the questions we have to ask the state as a part of this. And what about uh, a village designation area uh, south of the river? Because I think I, 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 I do recall that now it's coming back to me, the uh, getting that village designation seemed harmless enough at the time. But one of the things was it wouldn't be able to include uh, south of the river have to be a second one because they they yeah they wouldn't i know they wouldn't allow you to have a contiguous village center through the floodplain onto the south part mm -hmm. uh, because it's just a, a very elongated weird geography but with this nda program i'm hoping there's more flexibility mark 
and that we can make the argument that like yeah, the village, you know the, the, it's the land that's out of a floodplain on the south side but it is connected to the village via pedestrian infrastructure mm -hmm. and therefore it should be involved my understanding is the village designations are going away at some point you know because you're, you're breaking it down if they're going to become core that's what they're going to be they're yeah. going to be called okay. core designations yeah so they're changing the designation then just semantically and you can have two cores you can uh under the new scheme you can have two cores correct and so in that circumstance mark if we if we end up in a place where right now the state says we can't have any area south of the river in the nda when we go do our new regional future land use mapping when we're in charge we can assess if south of, south of the river if part of it would be eligible for a core and part of it be eligible for its own neighborhood now this neighborhood area doesn't have to be on water and sewer i believe that is one of the requirements or it has to be sewer ready maya do you recall off the top of your head i don't i think i think yes Sewer ready, but not sewer, sewer ready. Necessary. Yeah. yeah. You also have to have that complete streets and, and plans. Uh, you know, plans. So, I mean, it's it's going to be in the areas that have water and sewer. So, it's not going to include North 89. Mm. Probably oh. not. Yeah. But yeah. you tell me if you want to look at it. Yeah. Presumably, if we, you know, we are trying to include the area south of the river in our village center, because it is walkable to the village center. So if we set up a second village center, then the quarter mile radius would be quite a bit bigger. You know, I mean, it would extend all around that as well, correct? It would extend around a second village center designation. So, um, that's something presumably that we have to ask people about, right? The program, whether they're accepting of having a second one with a second neighborhood development area around it. And I was just, this Bart, I was just going to observe for Taylor and Maya's benefit. There's kind of a toehold of water and sewer on that side of the river. So it's, it's not fully point. served, but there is a section that's served. It, it would be considered ready, I would think, you know, because yeah. there are stubs that can go out from there. And there is some infrastructure already there. I think yeah, that definitely. that supports the argument of like, oh, it's already connected right. at, in a limited fashion. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that would be something that Taylor, that you would you all, Maya, would look at as you were assessing our ordinances. Correct. That, or, yeah, or, that I can, you know, that we added into our desires because we do have village neighborhoods now going in south of the river, where the goal is to connect them to the core. So, two things. I just want to make sure, Virginia. So, are you? So, Richmond itself hasn't applied for a second village center, correct? Right now. No. All right. So, as a part of our conversation with the state, in terms of the map and the boundaries of this potential NDA, we can also talk about the mm -hmm. possibility of a second village center south of the river mm -hmm. is that correct mm -hmm. okay yeah yeah i got that maybe yeah. <laughs> you know maybe. Okay. I mean, yeah. when we get there we haven't really had that conversation either on the planning commission okay. but it's certainly possible since we are planning to integrate it you know beginning to integrate it into the core because it is walkable and it has water and sewer so you know act 47 181 apply to the residential neighborhoods in that area so you know it makes sense to either incorporate it into the current village center or if you think that that would not be possible because of the floodplain and the wetlands and so forth then another village center I don't now, know. i'm looking through the the not not the actual application itself but the application guidelines and i know that in years prior it had been a requirement that you have access to water and sewer or be sewer ready or, or one or the other. I don't mm -hmm. see that in the in the application guidelines anymore. Hmm. Um, and so we should confirm that, Maya. Okay. I we should also, yeah. I'll also make sure that it can be it if it has to be contiguous or not. I don't know. That's something to look for. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, are there areas just as like, so it sounds like you guys are, are interested in a bylaw audit of this area and possibly south of the river. Looking at this kind of quarter mile radius, are you interested in kind of expanding it um, north, east, or northwest if, um, if that area kind of fits with the requirements or are you wanting to keep it within what it is here? Wait, so we can take it out the gateway? I thought I thought uh, Taylor was saying we can't go out the gateway with it. I I was thinking that you the gateway probably would not be eligible based on your current zoning in terms of density. Um, but I know also know that you guys have been working on some changes or have some past some changes recently. What's the current allowed density in the gateway district? I think it's one acre without septic and boy, it's at least what 0. 0.5 or 0. No, I, it, with. I think we increased it when we made it the gateway residential so commercial district. We recently made it into the residential gateway commercial. I don't know. You'd have to check on that, Keith. Mm -hmm, I'm on it. It sounds like that's a follow up of interest. I mean, back to red light, yellow light, green light. Okay. If we're doing a bylaw audit, we can throw one more district in. It's not a big deal. And so we can look at the gateway, I think. But Keith, yeah, let us know what the density that is there anyways. Even if it doesn't have water and sewer? Yeah. I, I'm thinking that even if it doesn't have water and sewer, yeah. Yeah, it's 10,000 square feet, so just, just shy of a quarter acre. Got it. So, yeah, a little over, you know, four units an acre. That's lot size, so. You do density separate from lot size? Yeah, maximum residential density is one dwelling per 5,000 square feet. Okay, yeah, that's good, so. okay. Um, I'll check with the state about water and sewer if it's, if you have to have the infrastructure or be ready or plans or what kind of that specifically is too. So when we're talking about manipulating the one quarter, would that mean, for instance, you could move in from where the floodplain is and move out with your one quarter acre in some other direction? Is that what you're suggesting, that you can actually quarter make months. it so it's not actually a quarter of an acre around the whole thing, but like on the south side, there's nothing virtually because of the floodplain if it's not eligible, but then you can make it maybe like a half an acre. I mean, yes. a half a mile on the on the north side or on the, you know, west side. Possibly. Yes. Okay. We, we have to make the argument, but yeah. Yeah, it's not like a full, you know, pull from here to add there like you could have your full quarter mile and then expand it a half mile in one direction if that area was walkable met the requirements right um etc mm -hmm. so it's not like a kind of displacement thing but um but okay. yes you can kind of shift it beyond that that's just kind of like the main framework because that's the yeah i forget the other term for it but around pillar centers now, I'm sorry I had to step away for a moment there, and maybe you covered this, but um, is it possible to roll the uh, village designation south of the river into this grant investigation, <laughs> or is it really <laughs> worthy of it? I mean, if we just say, oh, yeah, we're going to, we've been through the song and dance on doing the village north of the river, can't be that different. But we could at least explore um, the the neighborhood designation, what that would look like if we sort of centered the village designation around the uh, the the four way intersection at the Round Church. Yep, we can ask Mark certainly as a part of our investigation. We've got a plenty of other questions for ACCD, so we can we can add that to the list. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I guess I guess the issue here is 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 are the commissioners interested in pursuing this, um, and if so, uh, do we want to give the green light to CCRCP to do the audit? 
Are there any downsides to doing it? I mean, it doesn't seem like there's any downsides, really. I mean, it's just giving, you know, possibly some housing developments a little easier time and would be something that attracts them at no cost to us. Perhaps. Yeah, and all we're trying to do right now, Virginia, is just provide you with some information, make an informed decision. Right. Well, I mean, that's why you want to know if there's any downside to it. You know, if there's no downside to it, then that's except time, of course, and effort. But um... on that front, just real quick, um, as Maya mentioned, uh, the current designation program is open and available until uh, October 1, 2025. So a little less than a year from today. Mm -hmm. um, we have a contract to do this work with ACCD uh, that expires on June 30, 2025. Um, so we can commit to work with you, you know, through that time, you know, into next fiscal year. Uh, we certainly don't want to abandon you if you're halfway through an application, we'll finish it up and get it in for you. Mm. Um, but just know that, yeah, we'd be looking to wrap things up late spring um, early summer next year in terms of our work with you on this. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it, what do you, what do you all think? <laughs> oh, go ahead. Maya, you were going to say something. I was just going to say it, it's maybe, I don't want to say likely, but there's a, there's a chance that the audit comes back that some bylaw changes would be needed to be made um, prior to an application. So that kind of could be looked at once an audit is done. Mm -hmm. Chris, do you have any input on this topic? You. It sounds like there's no reason not to, and this next step is is just generating useful information. So yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, I mean, you know, we do have a bunch of other things to do, including starting to work on our town plan update, but um, we'd have to fit it in, obviously. So, yeah, I agree. Mark, what do you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely worth exploring. I'd love to. Uh, I'm curious to see how it'll be received in the community, but uh, I think yep. it's got some potential for sure that uh, is worth worth going with. Yeah. Okay. Allison, how about you? You'll have to unmute yourself. <clears throat> Unmute. Yes, that's good. Oh, that okay. It. All right. I, I pushed the wrong button. No. Yes. Thank you, Virginia. No, I am. I am in favor. Uh, definitely. Uh, in particularly because we've had so much bizarre weather the last couple of years, and the, with the floods and everything, I think that a study like this is a great idea. Okay. Sounds good. Bard, do you have any comments? Do you want to say anything as our uh, honored guest here? <laughs> no, but thank you for offering. I'm trying not to, uh, you know, make too high a profile presence, but I appreciate the conversation. The only thing I observe is what people have already said is it seems like a, um, um, a risk-free endeavor to go mm. to the next step. Mm -hmm. Um, and Keith, do you have anything to say that you think you we can squeeze it into our work here? <clears throat> I think so, especially since CCRCP is going to be doing the heavy lifting on this. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, it definitely has been something that we've been interested in since I started, and we're picking this up from where Ravi left off on it, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I think it's a no-brainer to at least go through the process of figuring out what exactly where we stand in the application process. Yeah. All right. Well, that sounds to me like uh, a unanimous decision to carry on. Does anyone have an objection to characterizing this as a unanimous decision to ask the CCRPC to include us in their planning? All right. We'll so take thank that you. As, as a motion of approval. So thank you. Yes, thank you all for coming and um, we'll talk to you about these questions uh, and um, submit our bylaws, I guess. Yeah, so so a couple, couple questions there. 
Yeah. And so I know that you're in the middle of a bylaw uh, amendment, correct? Correct. Yeah, several actually, several. but yeah. And, and remind mm -hmm. me of your timeline on that or pr proposed timeline. Well, maybe the most um, relevant one is our village neighborhoods. We have a village residential neighborhoods north and south which is currently in its final stage at the select board, which is going to be on the 7th of Got October. It. So Got we it. will then we understand have to take it back to <laughs> regroup act 47 to look like act 181, which has some density, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, <I don't> <laughs> confusions apparently yeah. that are different from the guidelines that we got last year about act 47. Um, so, you know, I guess that'll be probably a couple of months and that should be approved. Uh, we didn't have a lot of opposition to that, the way it was written with the new 181, you know, it's a little more challenging, but I'm sure that we will end up with those designations. So there's that one. And then there's a floodplain one, which mm -hmm. is probably not too relevant to this process. So. So I'm thinking we should be auditing your proposed bylaws, correct? Like we should be looking at your proposed language to see if it qualifies for NDA or not, since it likely would be in place by yeah. late spring, early summer. Okay. Yeah. And certainly after the seventh, you know, after next Monday, when we have the select board right. hearing, if there's no major issues there, then we're just going to work 181 into it and we don't have any choice about that. So there's no point in having a lot of public discussion about it probably. Um, yeah. But so yes, correct. Uh, other question would be, you know, would be, you know, uh, we're already in October would be coming back to you with the results of this bylaw audit in early December be too much of a crunch on your calendar or uh, would that would that sound okay? And I'm also looking at Maya to see if that is possible. Right. Yeah, probably December. I mean, we'll fit it in. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. I will make sorry one last thing. Yes. Uh, I'm going to make an ask of of you all. Yeah. Um, as we started the talk about tonight, our uh, CCRPC is about to embark on a, a a really substantial process to develop this new regional future land use map in the next. Mm six to nine months. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to stress that we really want to work with the town of Richmond to develop the part of the, to, the, to develop Richmond as part of that map um, in a way that's collaborative and cooperative and really reflects what the town of Richmond wants. Um, and so we hope we can get some time on your calendar in the springtime to review some maps with you that uh, we hope to include as a part of that regional future land use map. Uh, we plan on uh, reaching out to Keith to develop our own little customized engagement plan for Richmond um, to make sure we're talking to the right folks as we develop our map for Richmond this spring. Part of what we need to do as a regional planning commission is we specifically need to uh, talk to environmental justice focused populations as defined in statute. And so um, if there are particular people or organizations, either the senior center or an environmental justice climate group or folks that frankly were, were impacted by the floods this past couple of years that you want us to talk to, um, please start thinking about that, letting Keith know. Um, and yeah, we just, we hope we can find some time to work with you in the spring on your very busy calendar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, the thing that I see as being possibly the most problematic because we haven't really started on it is thinking about the forest blocks and the outlying mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. You know, we we have been working on the village in the last couple of years and mm -hmm. we have the commercial districts left that will have to have, they have some residential uses, so they're going to have to have some 47-181 redos uh, there. But what we really haven't done is worked on natural resource standards and how we are going to carry out the mandates of the mm -hmm. state for the habitat connectors and the forest blocks and the outlying areas and, you know, mm -hmm. what we're going to propose for clustered housing or any of those other things that we need out there. So we're, we're going to need more help from you, maybe. <laughs> 
with that, then yeah, I don't know if you're going to be able to do it because a lot of this has been state mandated, but put on the backs of the municipalities to develop how it's actually going to be done. And, you know, we're starting to work with BioFinder and those kinds of mapping tools to see what kind of regulations will have data to back them up, you know, to use the data. What, what is the data? You know, how can we use this data? We can't just be making these arbitrary rules. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to have some data if we're going to be trying to grapple with 2030 and 2050 and, you know, Act 179 and all of those other acts that impact the natural resources aspect. We have a lot of forested land in Richmond. Mm -hmm. How are we going to deal with that? So, so two things on that. <laughs> you yeah. know, I would say with, with the original future land use map uh, project, you know, we're we're we are restricted to just identifying these ten different typologies over the land. That's what we're restricted to. Um, typologies. What's typologies mean here just, in this context? To say it in a different way, we're essentially um, restricted to 10 different types of districts. So like there's going to be like a, the, the, the center district and then there's this planned growth area and there are village areas which are different transitional areas. There's uh, resource based recreation areas, rural areas. So we're just trying to take the land and, and to divide it into these 10 different categories. And to do that, we have to rely on these definitions of the statute and then really look at the planning that you guys have done locally and try to reflect that in our own regional map. Virginia, what you're talking about, you know, is much more detailed in terms of how you locally regulate, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, we'd love to work with you on that too. <laughs> That's probably a separate project. Right. Um, right. That we need to go get some money money to help you with. Okay. Uh, but yeah, but I, I I hear you. It's it's a lot, and I think um, yeah, I think Richmond can can do a stronger job protecting those natural resources in your rural areas. Yeah, I think there's cross pollination in there, uh, honestly, with the two different mm -hmm. endeavors. Yeah. So. Does it would it help us to have those ten typologies? Do, where do I find those? Do you want to send them to us? Or do... Sure. They're, they are in Act 181. And, uh, oh, they're in they Act 181, are... along with all the other things that are in Act 181. <laughs> so it's October. So the state statute website will be updated this month. And so navigating Act 181 should get easier. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> should be. But um, those 10 different typologies are going to be right in 24 VSA 4348A, elements of a regional plan. Okay. All right. And I mean, it doesn't make any difference, probably based on what you're saying that our designations match your designations, but you're going to have to put our designations into those designations somehow. Yes. And uh, so I think, I think, uh, let's not talk about regulations for a second. Let's just talk about our plans and our future land use maps. You have one regionally, you have one locally in your town right, plan. Right. And so I think if anything, uh, the Regional Planning Commission doing our regional future land use map first, essentially, in this cycle, um, could could mean that Richmond, when you guys update your town plan, you could copy our same 10, ten typologies. You could copy our future land use map and just use it locally if you want it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a local decision if you want to do that or not, right. but, um, yeah, and let's it, leave it there. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't really deal with the regulations, which is what we're going to have to deal with, but no, I mean, it, you know, so. it, your, your, your future land use map in your municipal plan is the basis of your regulations, right? Like that's, that becomes the basis of your zoning districts and how you regulate places. And so more or less, that, Virginia, yeah. <laughs> you might want to keep your own map or you might want to use yeah. ours. We could talk about it when you get there. Okay. All right. Very good. We'll Sorry to take us down the rabbit hole. We'll see start you guys with this piece. Number. We'll start with this piece. Yep. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you, Taylor and Maya. Appreciate Thanks, it. Yep. Thank you, Maya. Flag. Sorry. Last thing. I just um, started the initial um, review of your town plan. Yes. So that is coming um probably i had to push it from for another town plan so probably like late november 
but I have started that with other staff. So what so, that means, yes. what that means. <laughs> yes. So uh, about 18 to 24 months before every municipal plan expires, CCRPC does what we call an initial review mm -hmm. of your town plan. Mm -hmm. And what that's going to be is a memo to the planning commission saying, hey, these are some really great things about your plan. These are some things you can improve. Here are some things that, uh, here are some places where your plan no longer complies with state statute. Right. And so we're going to kind of, we're going to provide you that memo and you okay. guys can use that as kind of an outline to go through as you update your town plan when you great. work on it. next. Year. Yeah. Like the affordable housing piece where you have to have some very specific new things mm -hmm. based on that's all going to be in there in your suggestions, right? Well, that's handy. Yeah. Should be in good. there. Yeah. Good. <laughs> It'll be in there. <laughs> we look forward to seeing that. Great. We'll try to get that to you maybe around the same time. I probably, that's probably more like a January thing, Maya, we're thinking. Okay. Okay. That'd be okay. Oh, and so maybe we can, we, maybe we can box those up together, your bylaw audit and your initial town plan review. And maybe we can just have one meeting with you in January. We can yeah. see how the okay. time works. All right. And do you want us to get you our proposed changes zoning yes, changes please. that we expect to proceed to completion yes please okay keith will do that thank you folks all right bye. great you thank you so much yep you nice to meet you all yes nice to meet you, you. we'll be talking later on <laughs> thank you yep bye now well um for Janice is barred. That's sort of what I came for. I know you have other stuff to do, and I appreciate all the other stuff that you do month <laughs> after month. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so thanks for all that. I really do appreciate the work that you and Keith are putting into all this. So thank Great. you. Great. Well, we'll see you on Monday. Yeah. We're coming for our proposed. Um, Quite the agenda. Amendments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a busy one. Yeah. yeah. So if you can try to get there to try to get your items early on the agenda with my well, only piece of advice. That, that's my push tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. they're tentatively at 930, which is hey, you know. not good. But all um, right. Well, yeah, we're working on it. In any case, thanks so, so much. Good. All right. Great. Thank you. Take care, y'all. <laughs> okay. Well. So we got some work to do here in the future, but we knew that, right? All right. So we will move on to our second and final item, um, which is to look at the actual rewriting of section 3.9 and 512 for Jolina Court. This is not, we're not quite ready to talk again about the density bonus piece that we have agreed on the broad uh, outline of um, and we're putting together the details, the administrative details, how it's going to work, what the exact standards are, etc. So we're still working on that. That is, takes a little more research and thinking about things. So, But what we can do tonight is we can just look at section 3.9. The changes are actually fairly simple and make sure that we are agreed on those changes. And then we're just going to plug in the density bonus section. So it looks like Keith is going to bring up that document. Are we going to VC draft eight red line? Yep. That sounds good. Let me get you focused in here. Okay. And hopefully people have looked at this. This has been on our agenda like many times over the last okay. few months. Um, it's been a while, we, but yeah. Yeah. We slightly rewrote the purpose. Um, to focus a little bit more on the residential uses. So previously, it was more like this is going to be part of the, you know, commercial district with some residential. So it's not looking like it's going that way. So we've added more language about residential and providing residential properties where the residents can support the local businesses. So um that's the purpose i don't know if anyone wants to make any comments about that <laughs> so 
Okay, we can scroll down. I mean, if you want to just make some notes and at some point have some comments that you think of, that's fine. Um, some of the same language is being used. 3.9.2, we changed the, just changed the title to match the newer titles that we're using, like the Village RC District, the Gateway RC District. We've simplified it to titling the second section permitted uses. And in this district, we have the same uses that we had before as permitted uses, but we have also added single family dwelling, two family dwelling, and three and four family dwelling, because you're required to have that in districts that allow residential uses that are served by water and sewer. That's yeah. Act 47. It's mm -hmm. not super applicable in this case. We don't think anybody's going to build a single family house on the Jolina Court property, but they could, or the Richmond Community Kitchen property, which is also in this district. And then we have these other um, commercial uses that we're leaving in there. We're not taking them out. Um, so in the Jolina Court District, you could have a hotel, for instance, you could have a laundromat, you could have an inn, you can have professional offices, any of these things, um, Buttermilk is willing to put on their, in their buildings if they wish. So they could put up a hotel there if they decided that was what they wanted to do. So or, or we haven't the, changed any of those. We don't want to take away uses that they are have been expecting to be able to use. Sorry, Keith. Yep. Sorry, I'd cut you off. I, I just wanted to add that, you know, instead of just buttermilk, is maybe the developer du jour, you know, in 10 years from now, it's not strictly buttermilk. Right. Whoever owns that particular property, whoever owns the Richmond Community yep. Kitchen property. And something for folks to think about over time this is not really related, but if we are ever going to have a lot more traffic, it may be that we need to consider putting in place a mechanism for buying the uh, Blue Seal feed building, the RCK building, and moving it somewhere else. It's a historic building because we might need that land to make that access bigger. So not going to appear in this zoning um, rewrite, but something to think about over time. All right, any questions or comments about the permitted uses? Basically, the same ones that we've had. And in this case, it's dwelling multifamily, and it's not limited to three or four. It's just a multifamily dwellings, which is what we've got <laughs> so yeah. far. Um, or a mixed use building in the case of building number one, but building number two may be full, fully residential. So, all right, and we get down to conditional uses. So these uses are also available. We have changed commercial multi-use building because we changed that definition from section seven to a multiple use building. So that's just a different title. Um, planned residential development or residential PUD. We've added or residential PUD since we're now allowing building two to be completely residential if they wish. Okay. We'll, we'll and, Getting into the minutia a little bit, we'll update this E here um, and we'll move everything up. Just the, just yeah, the right. Numbering. The numbering will be fixed up. So we haven't really taken anything out, any of these uses that we put in originally in this district. Um, you know, they haven't been wildly filling building one's commercial space with any of these commercial uses, but they're there and they're available. Mm -hmm. It would be a small hospital if they put one in, but anyway. <laughs> oh, clinic. yeah, clinic, small hospital. All right, so we come down to 3.9.4, the residential density and requirements. So a couple of changes here. We've changed 
the wording of the residential density to base residential density. And if you recall, that's because we want to be able to add the density bonuses to form a total residential density. So this is the base residential density is 1 15th of an acre, which is what we've got because we're requiring any additional density to be earned through the density bonus program. So the density is still 1 15th of an acre. And we've left the wording of developable acre. It's different from the other districts, but we're going to leave it that way because that's the way we put it in. And then we have added this section, residential density bonus units that meet the requirements of section 6.15 that we're working up shall be allowed in addition to the base density units. The total number of units for the parcel shall not exceed the maximum total residential density of 20 units per developable acre. In other words, they can go from a total of 45 to a total of 60 for their three developable acres. But the 15 extra must follow the schemes. Yep, the 15 extra must come from the density bonus units. And this is a line that we can put in other districts that we wish to allow to have density bonus units. For instance, our RC districts, do we wish them to have density bonus units? In the AR, do we wish them to have density bonus units? Because of Act 181, it looks like density only starts with a building that has five or more residential units in it. So um, we're going to have to work on that in some of the other districts that we've already worked on because it's new information from Act 181. Anyway, so this is the first district that we have put this density bonus line in. Um, and we put the, the maximum there that you can see that we talked about last week. Section 6.15, we're working on that, that has all the parameters about the density bonus program. All right, any questions about that? That is kind of what we agreed about last time is that was the way we were going. I would, I would add on, on top of that, that what I'm focusing on partially is the administration of, of the, the schemes of the truly affordable. How are we going to do that as a town? And I'm working through that right now. That's why it's not ready at this point. We'll be revisiting that and showing you what, what we're doing and get your input on that. Well, there's that, and then there's the actual requirements for the senior adaptable units and the actual requirements for a parking scheme. So, you know, how they're going to work, how they're going to be monitored, if so, you know, if, if they are to be monitored, so and so forth. So that's all going in the density bonus section. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so we moved down a little bit. We're leaving everything else as is, except we've added that you can have a residential PUD because we are allowing building two to be fully residential if they wish to go that way. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, dimensional requirements four lots. And here, this is based on um, Act 47. No lot shall be smaller than 0.2 acres. This is to allow a density of five units per acre or more. In this case, the density is more. It's 15 units per acre. Mm -hmm. And we don't expect them to be subdividing into lots of 0.2 acres, but that is a requirement of Act 47, that that's a regulation in districts served by water and sewer with residential uses. So we have added that in there. We put one fourth acre, which was like 
what we had originally planned for the neighborhoods to be a quarter of an acre, which they also have to go to a fifth of an acre. So, uh, okay, and 181 makes that even more confusing, which we are going to have to talk about after the public hearing on the VRNs, because they're going to have to come back to us for changes newly available to us from Act 181. But we'll be talking about that at our next meeting. So, all right, moving on from the lot area, the lot dimensions, lot frontage, which is already grandfathered at something less than that, but that's okay. Um, and we allowed the lot coverage to go to 90% of the developable ground area of the lot. So, because they have three acres that will have no development on it, oh. except possibly parking. Okay. So, since they're going to have to now fit 60 units, they're going to be able to, if they elect the density bonuses, fit 60 units in there. We felt that they could use more of the developable space for their building because they have all that preserved space. Mm -hmm. And I do not think that they objected to that. Okay, so the 3.9.6, it looks like, yep. dimensional requirements, the height is the same as it always has been for all the districts. The height of any structure shall not exceed 35 feet, except provided in section 411, which allows for like cupolas and things like that, or section 6.16, which is the affordable housing development portion of Act 47, which allows you an extra story if you meet their affordable housing criteria. So we had to reference that because theoretically they could elect that and then we would have to allow them to be at an increased height. And we're going to have to add that into um, the other, like the RC districts, we're going to have to add that language to section 6.16, which is mm -hmm. going to be part of our brief review of those to make them compatible with 47181. Any questions? Yeah, Allison. Yeah, um, I was just wondering about the um the height of the structure don't we have a limitation because of our fire trucks no well it's really a little um with any buildings that are sprinklered or have other systems in I you see. can't okay. restrict it based on the fire trucks that's like an old system of how we how we designated height and you know people may wish to keep that just so that buildings don't get very high but the fire trucks is a little bit um, is a little uh, unnecessary now to feel that that is a restriction on how high you can go. There are a lot of buildings that are higher than fire truck ladders, you know, fire mm -hmm. trucks and ladders. So um, it's a discussion that we're going to have to have community wide, especially if anybody elects the affordable housing proposal and then says, OK, the state allows me to go one higher even though your limit is 35 feet, they will be allowed to go one story higher, mm -hmm. no matter what we say. So this is a discussion that may come up at some point if anybody elects to do that, which they may or may not. Thank you. Yeah, okay, moving on. Um, 3.9.6, any other changes? Not really any changes. Um, this date, I think, has been absent from the regulations, so we're just putting it in. The setbacks are the same, pretty much. Yep. Um, the footprints of principal structures we left alone, that's going to be the same down there at the bottom of your screen. No principal structure shall be 
greater than 10,000 square feet. So far, nothing has been proposed. <coughs> okay, other requirements. Um, the parking requirement obviously has to be changed. Jolina Court had its own residential parking requirements based on the number of bedrooms. We are required by Act 47 to only require one parking space per dwelling unit. So that's it. That's the new recommendation, and you're not really supposed to try to get around it anyway. Um, other uses follow the table. Bike racks shall be required. Uh, and then we have this additional in green, item number four, additional parking spaces designated for public parking may be elected as part of the density bonus program, see section 6.15. So that's just referencing it and if, you know, Somebody would have to go to the bonus program to find out what the parameters are of that. But we have allowed it, and that would be allowed, you know, if any other district, if we wanted to allow for additional parking spaces, we would have to put that in. Okay, going on through the traffic. Um, and the only thing that we added there as far as number D adequate improvements for wheelchair access. If we're gonna allow senior adaptable dwelling units, there have to be disabled parking spaces, which they have to have anyway, mm -hmm. but connecting routes to the town, to the town sidewalks. So, um, and that's one of the site components of making a senior or adaptable unit is having it be able to be navigated all the way from this municipal infrastructure to the unit. Yep. All right, any questions there? All right, and then the district specific design standards, which we just changed the name to match the name in the other districts that we've done now. Um, come down, this is all the same as was there before. Uh, Changing so, the name, wording. Just changing the name there to match. And then we have added something about the additional multifamily housing standards because we didn't have any multifamily housing standards when this district was originally created in 2020. So these buildings contain three or more dwelling units. They will adhere to the multifamily housing development standards. Oh, that's such. Um, okay, fire protection, environmental concerns, I, we just left that the way it was, no changes there. Okay, so that is, those are all the changes, they're pretty minor, the actual changes to section 3.9. The meat is going to be in the density bonus section, which will be in addition to this, it will go in with these, this packet of amendments. But the other thing that we do have to do, since we're removing the commercial space requirement for floor number one, is we have to make this minor change to section 5.12, the PUD section. Um, so the changes there are 5.12.2B, we have removed Originally, in the Jolina Court District, a residential PUD was not allowed because everything had to have a commercial component. Now we have allowed Building 2, at least, to be completely residential. So we're removing the JC from not allowing a residential PUD. So the only district now that it is not allowed in is the downtown district. And when we look at that district, we may want to change that too. I don't know. Okay, then, so we have added a PUD or residential PUD shall be allowed in the JC. We have added that district there. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
And that's a, that's a nod, obviously, to the existing structure that's there. You know, that's exactly really all that is. Well, that, I mean, it's that's a nod to the building too. The building that is there, oh. building one, is going to have the commercial component, but building two may not have a commercial component. And that is spelled out down here in number G. Uh, PUD may contain only commercial uses or mixed commercial and residential. In the, you know, the village commercial, the commercial and the IC, we have said at least 50% has to be commercial. In the VD district, we had decided here that it, residential uses were restricted to the second floor and above. And in the Jolina court, we had also said that, but now we're saying residential uses shall be allowed on any floor except for buildings with frontage on Bridge Street. That's building one that already exists and was built under other regulations. So buildings with frontage on Bridge Street, in which case residential uses shall be restricted to the second floor and above. So basically this is just removing the commercial requirement from building two and any other building, only they won't have any residential uses available to them. And it, unless, let's say they don't take any density bonuses now, at some later date, they might want to build a building that has 15 density bonus units, you know, achieved by way of the density bonus section and they would be allowed to have residential uses on any floor. So those are the changes that we have other than the density bonus section. Does anyone have any comments or questions about those? No, other than we'll need to do, you know, targeted outreach to the parcel owners for the public meeting, I think. We can do that. There are two parcel owners. Okay. We can do targeted outreach quite easily. Um, we had a suggestion to do it to the village residential neighborhoods, I think, targeted outreach, but that seemed like a large amount of work on our part, and we're opting to put it in Front Porch Forum. And <clears throat> the targeted outreach has been done to the people in those neighborhoods who have participated in this conversation. So Christy Witters and Bard and, you know, Dave Healy, Gary, Kathleen Gent, those people who have been a part of this conversation um, have been contacted about the VRN he hearings uh, on Monday at the select board. So, yes, we will do targeted outreach and, you know, explain to Buttermilk what we're doing, but yeah. I'm sure they're looking at they're it. They're aware. Yeah, they're aware. So any comments or you can think about comments if you have any. It, there's really not that much change here. And the big change is the density bonus yeah. question. So. This looks good. <laughs> yep. All right. So that's all we have on the schedule for tonight. We're... Um, we're going to have to, as I said, I, we are sure that we will have after the select board hearing on the village residential neighborhoods on Monday, we will need to have those back, even if there's no public comment about them, because we will have to go over the new guidelines for Act 181, which alters the guidelines of Act 47 and are going to <clears throat> require some rewriting, a little bit of rewriting about the density. It's, so, not a ton. it's not a ton. It's easy to follow. It's just getting the requirements down, specifically on duplexes and multifamilies. Yeah. So. And after the select board has its hearing and uh, requires us to relook at anything that comes up, plus this Act 181 stuff, then we will do another targeted outreach to those same people, telling them that we're going to talk about it 
because we're going to have to make some changes. We are not required to have another public hearing about the VRNs, but um, we're going to have a meeting about it and talk about it. Yeah, what, Keith? I said the select board is required to have a public hearing, though, once it comes back. Yeah, the select board, after we make those changes, we will send it back to the select board, and the select board will have another public hearing about it with those changes in place. Do we, do we know specifically what those changes are? Yes, we do. Do we it's have a list of that? It's it's a pretty short list, Mark. It's it's Good. basically it's, it's yeah <laughs> exactly. It's it's really two items at this point. Um, yeah, we'll have to you know really suss it all out. But it's the duplexes and the multi families that required. They're absolutely required. We have no choice. So that's really a no brainer for us. That's not that's yeah. a, a non issue. Yeah. It's a non-issue. It's going to be confusing, actually, to administrate. I mean, it's even almost you could consider it one item, which is that density doesn't apply to anything under five units. It just doesn't. It doesn't apply to duplexes, and it doesn't apply to three to four unit buildings. So, Let's you know, that's going to mean that you can it, you can put a four unit building on your point two acres if you can work with the coverage and the setbacks, which, yeah. you know, <laughs> I'm sure the residents are not going to be too happy about, but yeah. it's going to be pretty tough to get water and sewer expanded south of the river with those numbers. Well, yeah. I don't know. They have extra capacity, so they may wish to. No, I just don't think the neighbors will will want to be sanctioning 0.2 acre four unit apartments as neighbors yeah well they may not be able to have any choice but it's going to well, be weird they're not if they're if they're not on sewer yet then no problem they're on sewer and water or if they're all if they're not on sewer and water yet they are going to not want to get on water and sewer and expand that district south. But the, the VRNs already include the water and sewer district, though, in totality. Yeah, the VRN is good. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, I'm out of VRS. Yep. Yeah. Well, the VRS is going to, I mean, let's say a developer comes along and Same. a neighbor in that neighborhood sells them a 0.2 acre parcel. If they want to be able to supply it with water, even if they're not on water and sewer, they can make a well and supply it with water and a septic field if they can, if they have enough space. You know, it's going to be hard to do on a 0.2 acre, so it may be a moot point. No, 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 because we don't have to put that district in that tight of density if it's not already on water and sewer. But the district... So anywhere where there's water and sewer is what that district is. It encompasses every place south of the river where there is water and sewer. Yes. So where there is actual water and sewer and not just potential water and sewer. Oh, like, man. Yeah, yeah. You're, we're opening up a yeah. can of worms here. It's a horrible, people serious... Are gonna, people are going to want to carve out separate districts. Or where the water and sewer is now or the, potentially they could all right we'll deal with that yeah well we're gonna have at to the, talk about it at this meeting yeah when the vrns come back to us briefly I hope, I hope to be there uh monday so we can talk about that yeah monday at the select board which we have yet to get a time for a, which when it's going to be on the select board Hopefully agenda. earlier than better than later yeah well so far it looks like 9 30 but we're working That's on ugly. changing that <laughs> So anyway, um, so that's good. Um, Virginia, where then, do you see that 9.30? I looked at the, it doesn't look like there's an agenda on the town website for the select board meeting yet, or am I looking in the wrong place? No, it's not up yet. Okay. No, Keith is going to be working over uh, Josh pretty yeah. hard, I think. Yep. <laughs> a couple elbows, maybe a knuckle. I don't know, whatever it can do. Yeah, Josh would will post it tomorrow, but hopefully the propo his proposed agenda will have it a, a little earlier. <laughs> yep. So that's, that's the plan. That's the plan. All right. 
And so our next meeting will be on the 16th, and that is going to be the hearing on the um, flood hazard overlay district. And um, uh, have you gotten a final date and time for meeting with the three parks people? I think the three parks people was meeting tonight at this time. I know time. they were. Yeah. But so, I didn't I know you got you'd reached out to them a week or so ago yep. trying to schedule something for a site visit. Yes. And uh has that been defined yep. yet? That that's been had. It's it's happened. What? Jeannie, when I never saw that freaking email. Jeannie and Tyler Keith wasn't able to make it. So there's a memo that will come to you that reports what happened at that meeting. Um, and the how did other, that happen? I was looped in on that when you guys were talking about it, and then nobody ever committed to a formal date and time, and now it happened. Yeah, well, it was because it had to happen because Jeannie was going away. It had to happen like the next day, kind of thing. How come I didn't know that? I don't know. I could have made any date. How come I didn't know that? I'm real. That's very upsetting to me. Again, I, I, it's I think, like man, I keep getting sidelined on this conversation repeatedly. It's very frustrating to me that you've iced me out of this conversation. And wow. Okay. So, and then I missed the meeting tonight to come to this. I would have been better served going to the three parks meeting than coming here. Yeah, well, biscuit. you can read this memo, which I think you'll be which okay is, which with. Which is, you know, just colored exactly. The conversation has already taken place without the input I wanted to be able to provide to the three parks committee and in front of everybody. Well, the only point of that so meeting having was a to memo, find out what Tyler, what Tyler meant when he said that he had made those measurements about the playground structures. Yeah, there's a lot more to discuss. What did he meant? Than, yeah, well, than just that one little thing that you'll cover in your memo, and you knew that I wanted to share that, and yet I wasn't included or notified of this meeting taking place. That's unacceptable, unacceptable, Virginia. <laughs> what is going on? It was only for Tyler. You to don't like my what opinion, so you just. Don't include me in conversations. I'm really fine. Whatever. Whatever. Is there a motion to resign and retire? Although the first term, I might have been a Freudian slip, but <laughs> I'm really, really very frustrated at this point. And I'm sure you don't give a hoop because well, you're, get, just... you're getting... That was just Tyler's explanation. All right. Well, which you Jeannie cut, didn't uh, understand. She wanted Tyler's explanation. We've got so to. I don't I know wanna, that you would have been able to help. To, uh, to, to finish the meeting. To adjourn. Adjourn. Yeah, yeah, right now, before I hang up, and then you won't be able to without a quorum. Well, okay. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable give you every opportunity to treat me fairly and you, you you ice me out on everything okay so is that a vote uh is there a second second chris seconds Are i vote i anybody who is opposed to adjourning the meeting there are no other updates i assume that we need to get through do we have four? Yes, we still have four. So it doesn't any... matter. No, it doesn't matter. If there are no objections, then we can adjourn the meeting and we will see you on the 16th. And I will try to let you know what information we find out, which was the message that I got from you last time was to let you know what information we found out. So I will do that. Okay, folks. All right. So we'll see you all next time.